All right, I think we hit critical mass here, so we'll get started. Hopefully we pretty quick today. I know all of you have a lot of Zoom meetings, so uh, good morning, welcome. Thanks for joining. Good to see a lot of uh, familiar faces here, some new faces too. Uh, first, I should apologize. We don't have any uh, Dunker cookies or coffee this year um, as a result of the pandemic, obviously. So I've asked to double the budget for next year and hopefully we'll have uh, that. So something to look forward to finally. Um, a couple of housekeeping things. You probably saw the uh, pop up that we're recording this meeting. So folks who didn't make it can view it later or you all can go back and look at it. So we'll be posting it to the uh, OPB webpage after this meeting. Uh, please either raise your hand at the end of each section or put questions in the chat during. We'll answer any questions after um, each section and kind of open up for all questions at the very end. Um, I have everybody muted by default, um, but feel free to unmute uh, when you have a question to ask if, if you're asking one uh, after each section. And then uh, last thing I wanted to briefly mention is that we're holding a Q&A session next Friday at 2 p.m. So if you have any questions after this event, um, I sent the details of that in my reminder email, but uh, let me know if you didn't get that or if you need that. All right, so here is our OPB team that you'll be hearing from this year. A few uh, quick notes on our role for session. For those who don't know, uh, we produce budget briefs on all major budget proposals, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. We track uh, all bills relevant to the university uh, and coordinate those efforts with state relations, and we need your help for that, obviously. Uh, we coordinate responses to fiscal notes, uh, which are requested by the legislature. And in addition to that, of course, we respond to lots of uh, data and policy questions from the legislature, the administration, state relations, et cetera, uh, that come through from various places. So uh, safe to say we will get in touch with you for uh, many of those things and, and you're the experts that we rely on. So thanks in advance for your help. A uh, quick overview of specific roles. I'm the primary contact for the team. Feel free to reach out to me if you uh, don't know who to ask about something or if you have any general questions. Kelsey is our primary contact for fiscal notes uh, and she'll be helping with bill tracking and information requests. And she's also our lead on capital budget analysis. Jesse is our primary contact for bill tracking this year. And she's also helping with uh, fiscal notes and information requests and uh, she'll be leading operating budget analysis again this year. Lauren is helping with all of the above, of course, uh, and then is also kind of our resident expert on LobbyGov. She'll be uh, talking to you about our new system shortly. Um, so if you have any questions specific to LobbyGov, how to use it, if you have any trouble, uh, Lauren's probably the, the best person to start to reach out, reach out to. So. Um, that's about it, except for Mac. Uh, we're thrilled to have Mac join us this year. She's our graduate student intern. Uh, she's a second year MPA student, uh, is going to keep essentially be keeping us organized, sending out lots of bill reminders, and you'll probably hear from her on any amendments, that sort of thing. Uh, normally I'd have Mac wave, but she is, I believe, in class right now, so she gets to uh, be saved from the embarrassment this morning. Uh, really quick, some other new team members. Uh, Ruth was on the left was brought on by Jesse in February. She's been in all of our meetings. Uh, uh, Bruce on the right uh, is in Max House uh, and he's makes frequent uh, appearances with his favorite pineapple toy, which is also in the picture. Uh, and then in the middle is a new uh, addition to our state relations team as Joe has uh, again expanded his pack of uh, proud Huskies. So uh, that's it for me um, at the beginning here. I'll pass it off to Lauren, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, LobbyGov, then it'll go to uh, Jesse, Kelsey, back to me for the budget, and then we'll finish off with Joe at the, at the end here. So um, with that, I'll pass it off to Lauren. Thanks. Thanks, Jen. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Lauren Hatchett, and I'm a policy analyst with the Office of Planning and Budgeting. Um, and I'm gonna provide a quick overview of LobbyGov and direct you to a few website resources that may be helpful when reviewing legislation. So starting with the 2020, 2021 legislative session, OPB is transitioning from our homegrown bill tracker system to LobbyGov, which is a platform used extensively in bill analysis and legislative affairs in our state. 
LobbyGov notifies OPB when a tract bill has a hearing, when it's amended, and when it moves. Additionally, LobbyGov enables stakeholders across the university to assess legislation throughout the process. University stakeholders who have been asked to review legislation can access LobbyGov at uw.lobbygov.com using your UWNet ID to log in. You may need to use the SAML login if you're not automatically redirected. Um, but if you run into any issues or even if you need a user account, just feel free to reach out to anyone on our team. So just to start, there are two user permission levels within LobbyGov, liaisons and reviewers. Stakeholders who are designated as liaisons coordinate bill analysis for larger departments at the university, and they'll assign um, a bill to a specific reviewer to provide assessments. Once an assessment is complete, liaisons can review and approve assessments before submitting to OPB. But the vast majority of stakeholders are have reviewer permissions, and so I'm gonna focus on the reviewer's view of LobbyGov for the rest of the presentation. So as mentioned before, reviewers are assigned bills and asked to provide assessments. And after the bill has been assigned, a reviewer will receive the following email that is definitely legit and not spam, even though it looks a little spammy. Um, and it looks like this, so for your reference. Um, the email will notify you that you have a new bill assignment. So for this example, Senate Bill 5000 has been assigned to me. And at the bottom of the email, I can see um, that I can log in directly to LobbyGov. So after you log into LobbyGov with your UWNet ID, you'll see this page. In LobbyGov, a reviewer's to-do list shows any bills that are pending review. This shows me from left to right that Senate Bill 5000 has been assigned to me. Uh, there's no companion bill. The bill status indicates that it has been pre-filed. I can see the abbreviated title for quick reference. And most importantly, I can see when my review is due. So to provide analysis on Senate Bill 5000, I simply click review bill. But you'll also notice on the back to the right hand side that you can click on bills assigned to you and upcoming events. And this gray um, list is basically your navigational panel. So after I select review bill, I'll see this page. In the top left-hand corner, you can see the legislature bill page button, and you can click that to read the bill and review any documents like amendments. This links directly to the state's legislature page. After reviewing the bill, you should first determine if the bill impacts the university or if the bill is misassigned. Selecting misassigned will kick the bill back to OPB to determine if the bill should be assigned to a different department. If the bill doesn't impact your area, feel free to indicate that um, and indicating that won't impact any of the assessments. Beyond the initial review, there are three assessment questions, the third of which is new. So the first one is pretty simple. Please assess the impact of this bill on the UW. Second, do you have any suggested amendments? And the third is what outcomes, positive or negative, do you anticipate the bill will have for BIPOC students, staff, faculty, or community members and vulnerable communities? At the bottom of the bill review page, you'll be asked to recommend a position and priority. You can find guidance for selecting a position and priority on our bill tracking and legislative resources page, which I've linked in this slide and you can, you'll have this after the presentation. You can also attach files um, at the bottom of this page. And for example, if you had suggested amendments, but it was hard to convey that over email, you could easily type up your own amendments and upload it in LobbyGov. And then once complete, remember to click yes and then press the save button. And that's it. We've completed our bill review. Um, I'll just say that LobbyGov has a lot of new features compared to Bill Tracker. Um, and if you have any questions or run into any issues, please feel free to reach out to anyone on our team, most likely me. Um, and as I pre I've previously mentioned, we also have combined resources into a new bill tracking and legislative resources page, which can be found on our website. Feel free to go to uw.edu 
backslash OPB and scroll over to the state operations tab for, fur for further background and resources. And that's all I have. Does anybody have any questions about LobbyGov? Yeah, uh, this is Marty Cohen. <clears throat> Are you able to add bills that you have an interest in following, even if you're not gonna be analyzing it? Um, I'm also gonna ask Jed to chime in too, but I would say yes. Um, if can I do it? Or oh, do you have to do it? Do it. Um, I would say it's good for us to know. I, I don't think um, from a, a reviewer's permission level that you can add the bill yourself, but if there's a bill that you're interested in following just for following purposes, I would email our office and okay. ask one of us to add it for you. Okay, thanks. There are also other options through the legislature's website if you want to get email alerts on a specific bill, and that's probably the best way to track something for a personal interest, but if it has anything to do with the university or, or your role here, we're happy to uh, have it in the system. Yeah. Just, okay. Thanks, Jed. <clears throat> um, I got a question over chat basically asking if, um, if folks are able to see what other reviewers on a bill have reviewed and that that is still the case. So just like our old system, you can view what folks are saying about the bills that you've been asked to assess. So that should be in there. Are there any other questions? All right, hearing none, I'm gonna pass it over to Jesse. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see all of your tiny little squares this morning. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the legislative process and how to read bills and how to provide helpful analysis. And my name is Jesse Friedman. Um, so why does this matter? Legislative decisions impact pretty much every aspect of the university. So there's the really obvious things, higher ed policy, tuition, financial aid, access curriculum, um, and then there's the kind of things that keep the wheels on, uh, the UW budget, sustainability, transportation, real estate, healthcare policy, which is obviously a big topic um, this year, which affects UW medicine and the whole medicine enterprise. And then as Jed would say, lots of other things. Um, research policy, land use, forest lands, kind of anything you can imagine um, may affect UW as well. Um, and this is an area, all of these, I guess, in general, but specifically these kind of grab bags. We have a little bit of knowledge, but our knowledge of policy areas is kind of a, a mile wide and an inch deep. So we really do rely on all of your expertise throughout legislative session to kind of inform us and make sure we understand the nuance of all these different policy areas. So Thanks in advance for your work. A little bit of background on legislative terms. Um, house of origin or first house is where a bill is introduced. So that could either be the house or the Senate, the opposite house or second house. Once a bill gets through the house it was introduced in or through the chamber, um, it'll go to the opposite chamber. And I will talk more about the process in a moment. A substitute bill is a new version of a bill that replaces the original bill. Um, often bills will be moving quickly and going through committees uh, quickly, so there can be multiple versions of a bill that are alive at once, um, which is another reason to, to please read our emails. Um, striking amendments are bills that stay in the initial bill number, but there'll be an amendment that will strike everything in the bill. So functionally, it's an entirely new bill um, within the same bill number. An engrossed bill um, is legislation that has passed through one chamber, but has had multiple amendments integrated in and then becomes an engrossed version of the bill before moving to the opposite chamber. The legislative process, I touched on this a minute, a, a bit in the last slide, um, a bill will be introduced. Many bills have already been pre-filed, so you may have already gotten emails from our office. They then receive a public hearing in the committee, which is our best opportunity to give feedback. So often when you'll get an email like the ones Lauren showed, um, we are trying to get feedback in, in advance of these committees so we can kind of inform strategy and, and send someone to give testimony. After the committee hearing, it'll go to an executive session, which is when the committee will decide whether to move the bill forward or uh, not. Um, after that, it'll go to the house of origin floor where it can be moved on to the opposite house, vetoed or amended. 
Once it gets to the opposite chamber, it goes all the way back to the beginning. And again, we have opportunity to give feedback. Um, if it gets through the opposite chamber, then it goes to the governor's desk for his uh, signature or veto. Next slide. So once you get an email, um, like the ones that Lauren showed to ask to assess a bill, this is what the bill homepage looks like on the legislature's website. It has a lot of information, so I'm just gonna give a brief overview of really what you need to know. Um, obviously the bill number, title, who the sponsors are, are up at the top there. There's a little bit of an overview of where in the process the bill is in case that's just helpful reference. Next slide. And then down at the bottom, um, you can see the available documents. So this is really what we're needing you to review. Um, the bill documents are gonna be the body of the bill. Um, this, is, this is really what we're asking you to read and, and to read carefully. Um, please make sure you're reading the right version of the bill. The newest one will be last. This is a bill that passed several sessions ago, but you can see how many versions of the bill there are. Um, and often there may be multiple versions alive at once, so it's really important to read the right one. Bill reports, which you can see in the right column, can be helpful context. Um, they can provide a little background on different versions of the bill, sort of who's supporting the bill, who's opposing the bill, a summary, but again, um, it, it's not all the information. So it's a helpful resource, but not sort of the be all end all. And we do really need you to read the bill itself because um, often the provisions that we care about may not be things that are covered in like a high level summary and, and still can have large impacts on the university. So how to read a bill. Um, this is a fake bill. So I guess don't worry or get too excited. Um, so if you look at a bill, an underlined section that says new section will be all new language. So this whole section here is new language. This does not exist in a bill. Um, unless I get into the legislature. Um, and this bill, this section would recognize dubs, uh, the UW mascot as an effective representative of the UW and would seek to replace George Washington on the state seal with dubs the Husky. So this is all new text. Um, often these will be kind of at the beginning of the bill, but can be interspersed throughout. So if you see something that says new section, please review that whole section. <laughs> um, and if it doesn't say new section, that is generally existing RCW. So please don't do review it, but keep an eye out for these new sections that will be entirely new. Next slide, please. So then we can see here, this is not a new section. This is existing RCW. This is the RCW that we have that establishes the state seal. Um, struck out text is removed from existing statute. So this statute, um, establishes that General George Washington will be the central figure in the state seal. Underlying text is entirely new text. So here we are striking out George Washington. He's no longer in the seal and Dub the Husky is taking his place. So underlying text is new. They're not going to have red circles. It can often blend into, you know, really long bills. This can be easy to miss, but can have huge, huge consequences. Um, next slide, please in this case to the state seal, but often to the university as well. Um, so we want to make sure we're not missing things that may be kind of subtly hidden in there. Um, so we can advocate for important legislation like this. Next slide. So sample assessments, um, and Lauren mentioned the legislative resources page on our website, um, which has a lot of this information about how to provide an a helpful assessment. Um, so. Not to worry if you don't remember all of this, all of what I'm covering here is on the website as well. Um, this is a helpful assessment that we received a few years ago. Um, and, and why it's helpful is it provides us a detailed summary, it summarizes what the bill does, and it recommends a position. So you can see at the top here, HB 1722 amends the RCW to treat motorized foot, foot scooters as bicycles. Um, it says it aligns very well with WAC changes being submitted to the uh, transport, submitted by, excuse me, transportation services um, and gives an overview of what it does, recommends that the UW supports this bill. Um, and again, like, 
I think scooters are great. I don't know a lot about scooter policy. So having something like this is really helpful to kind of drill down what the policy is, how it aligns with UW policy, and then um, whether or not we want to recommend amending it. The last question here, which at least on my screen is, is cut off by this view, um, is the new question about equity impacts. So it's really important to us um, that we're being thoughtful about this. You know, don't come up with large equity impacts if it's a bill that is, you know, makes kind of a minor change, but it is really important to us and also really important to the state that we're thoughtfully considering um, these questions. So please be thoughtful, even if it, you know, seems like a small bill, it often will have equity impacts. And we're un our understanding is we may be asked to report this to the legislature this year, you know, as we should. Um, so please be thoughtful uh, in these responses. You don't have to come up again with sweeping impacts if there aren't any, but please be thoughtful about how this would affect uh, BIPOC students, staff, faculty, or community members and other vulnerable communities at the UW. Um, and I believe this is on the, uh, this will be on the slides that are on the website, so it'll be a, a non-cutoff version for more review. Um, less helpful, this is something that I came up with, so don't worry any of you that you submitted this. Um, this is an assessment that is not helpful. It says we should be concerned, but doesn't really say why, it doesn't really say which part is the concern. It says we should oppose it, which is a strong statement, but doesn't give us any ways to um, back the opposition up or recommendments for amendments. So, you know, kind of in, in contrast to the last one, this just doesn't really give us any footing to stand on in, in crafting an approach to dealing with this bill. Um, again, in a large piece of legislation, the part with UW requirements is really vague. We should oppose it is vague. It doesn't say why, also obviously vague. Next slide. So questions to consider, and again, this will be on the website. So what does this bill add or remove from existing law? Would it have a fiscal impact? So would you need to hire more people? Would there be large amounts of travel? Would a bunch of new things need to be bought? Um, would it have an impact on program delivery? For example, financial aid and enrollment, would it change how we are currently doing business in a way that would be, you know, have an impact? Um, would it have operational impacts, things like facilities and sustainability? And then what amendments would you recommend? If you do have concerns, how could we kind of negate those and, and improve this bill in its current form? Helpful reminders, um, we are every session tracking several hundred bills. So if you can be clear and be concise, um, note any areas of confusion, again, please provide us some education. You are all the experts in this area. Um, give us an a sense of importance and scale. For instance, you know, something like travel. If it's gonna have us driving to Olympia once a year, once every six months, it's maybe inconvenient, but not the end of the world. If this is asking someone to drive, fly to Spokane once a week, slightly different. Um, and since we're tracking so many bills, um, it is important for us to have a sense of what we really need to mobilize resources on, um, which obviously can't be everything. Attention to the version of the bill you're responding to. Again, things move really quickly. Please make sure you're responding to the latest or the version that we're asking you to respond to. And please respond as soon as possible. So um, second only to fiscal notes, which Kelsey will talk about in a moment, bill reviews are really important that we get timely feedback in. Um, so please, when you get those responses, respond as soon as possible um, so we can make sure to, again, be able to kind of craft a response. Next slide. And I see some questions in the chat, um, but feel free to chime in with any other questions you have. I can start off here with uh, <clears throat> Dan's question. So uh, that's a great question. So we, we once uh, assessments are submitted, we review those, basically the recommended position priority and the assessments. We kind of make a judgment call uh, on, you know, the, if there are multiple assessments, what the kind of final recommended position and priority should be. When bills have hearings, we pull a list of all the assessments and the bills that are coming up. And we talk through that list with state relations. We, we kind of discuss the bills, what the, what the feasibility of passing is, what, you know, what level of involvement the university could have that kind of thing. There's a lot of considerations that go into that. Um, but we really, 
in many ways don't know what our position or priority should be on a bill until we have your assessment. So that's kind of the most important piece to that process is, is knowing exactly how a bill will affect the university. And then we go from there and, and your input is very critical, especially for uh, state relations to be crafting their um, responses, with, especially when they're testifying for bills um, in Olympia. So uh, that's kind of the gist of that, but um, happy to dig in more if anybody has any questions about that. Thanks. Uh, and then Shelly's question, are equity impacts specifically defined by the legislature? If so, where do we find that? Um, to my knowledge, it is not uh, explained by the, or defined by the legislature. Joe or Jed may be able to chime in otherwise there. Um, I think just, just be thoughtful and use the best of your knowledge. If more information becomes available on what the legislature is looking for, uh, we'll be sure to pass that on. Um, but none exists as far as I know now. Um, and I see the question here about, is it possible to receive some sort of time frame? Absolutely. So um, in lobby gov, there'll be a, a deadline for when we'd like your feedback. Um, that's kind of a helpful when we, when we are hoping to get it by, I think obviously feel free to email us and say, kind of ask for a, a timeline update if, there are extenuating circumstances. Uh, we're also always happy to kind of just hop on the phone with you and get a 10 second overview of what you think um, if needed. And yeah, I think that is what I would say to that. As soon as possible is great. If it needs to just be quick, um, that's wonderful. And you will also get updates over emails as bills move, which should let you know when hearings are gonna be and things like that. So just keep an eye on those emails for deadlines as they as they come up one one quick other note on that if if we um have a hearing coming up and we don't have sufficient assessments we will email folks saying hey we don't have any assessments yet i'm sure lots of you have gotten that email before um that is kind of our last call for responses often we are sending that email like less than 24 hours before a hearing so if you get one of those emails especially please prioritize getting in an assessment as soon as you can and Jed, correct me, or Lauren, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe right now the lobby got, has it set at five business days as the deadline for most of them. So that's when sort of as soon as possible, sometime within that, uh, I believe approximately five business days, unless we know there's a hearing coming up and we might set it a little sooner. Correct. All right, I don't see any other questions or hands raised unless I'm missing somebody. All right, Kelsey, take it away. Okay, uh, so hi everyone. Uh, like Kelsey said, it's nice to see all your little faces on the screen. Um, I'm Kelsey Rote, I'm the Senior Policy Analyst for OPB. And uh, like last year, I'll be leading the whole fiscal note process from start to finish. Uh, so I'll kick us off with some updates and reminders. So what is a fiscal note? A fiscal note is an estimate of a bill's fiscal impact. So this is separate from the general policy, review, advocacy, opinions, et cetera, that you'll be doing in lobby gov. Fiscal notes are just for fiscal impact. Uh, a fiscal note shows how a bill would fiscally impact the UW over six or sometimes 10 years. Uh, must be based on the least expensive way, so not necessarily the ideal way to reasonably implement a bill. It's always tied to a specific version of a bill. So each time, like Jesse said, each time we get a substitute or second substitute, we'll have a new fiscal note for that. Um, they help legislators evaluate a bill's costs and merits and, before deciding whether to pass, reject, or amend. And they inform legislative staff, journalists, lobbyists, and everyone else involved in the legislative process. So why should you care about fiscal notes? They're important because they inform legislative decisions that impact UW. So if a bill passes, fiscal notes can be used to determine how much funding we will receive for a particular initiative. Uh, so they can thus have a direct impact on our state appropriations. We need to be responsive and accurate because if we don't respond, the legislature will assume the bill doesn't impact us and it probably does if we've been assigned a fiscal note for it. If a bill does have costs associated with it, the legislators won't know to amend the bill in a way that mitigates that impact or to provide funds to offset the fiscal impact. We also wanna maintain our credibility. Uh, so if one of our fiscal notes is way off base, the legislature might not take future submissions and cost estimates seriously. And we definitely want them to take our estimates uh, for what they are. So the tricky part, 
Uh, we usually have less than 72 hours between the time we get a fiscal note request from Olympia and the time we need to respond. The UW is engaged in a huge variety of activities and programs, so fiscal note requests cover a similarly large variety of topics. Uh, we get fiscal note requests from everything from shellfish aquaculture to interest arbitration for uniformed personnel, which I think actually passed last year. So like Jesse said, we in OPB try to be as knowledgeable as we can be about as many UW topics, uh, but obviously we need your expertise to actually understand those fiscal impacts. So the fiscal note process. Uh, so what does this actually look like within that 72 hours? So first, legislative staff requests that a fiscal note be completed for a given bill, and then OFM assigns that to different agencies. OPB receives the request, assigns it to an analyst, and they get to work analyzing the bill and figuring out who to contact as assessors, and we'll usually try to use whoever's in LobbyGov for that bill uh, as a starting point. The assigned analyst reaches out to assessors with due date, bill information, and potentially some initial thoughts and drafts, especially if we've done a similar fiscal note before. At that point, you all, the assessors, coordinate with each other, uh, so coordinate with the other people on the email, and then loop in anyone else that you think needs to be involved. So from there, you'll draft up some of your initial thoughts um, and calculations and any other information you have and send that back to your OPB analyst. Usually at that point, there's some back and forth about the details, assumptions, any inconsistencies, anything that we think will maybe draw some side eye in Olympia uh, between the analyst and the assessors. And the earlier we can start that process, the better, because sometimes that can be kind of lengthy to figure out some of those, de those details. Uh, at that point, there may also be conversations with other agencies or other higher education institutions so that we're all in alignment. Uh, this helps us not get revision requests, which I'll talk about in just a second, uh, and makes it so that we don't have to sort of redo our work the more we are in alignment. Uh, so once the fiscal note is finalized, your OPB analyst will put it into the OFM system. I'll review it and submit it off to OFM. They then distribute it to the legislators and staff who requested it. And at that point, they may request a revision or they may have a revision request if there was any sort of alignment issues between us and other agencies, or if they think our assumptions aren't right and that's not how they're reading the bill. Uh, so then we have to kind of go back to you guys and get more information at that point. And that's the whole process. So to re respond to a fiscal note request, uh, you'll initially, you'll receive an email from one of us, and when you do, note the due date and respond to let us know that you're on it. Read the bill, we'll be sending you a PDF and also linking to the bill page, uh, and Jesse and Lorna both talked about how to do that. So then you'll want to coordinate with the other people on the email, and at that point, re reply all and loop in anybody else that you think needs to be involved. Uh, you'll be receiving some templates from us. So you'll receive a Word document, which is for the narrative portion, and an Excel template that's for the calculations. And you'll want to fill both of those out. They're both super important for making sure that our logic uh, matches each other. And send those templates back to us. And at that point, also send any um, like backup documentation, whatever else you've been using to create calculations, uh, any other like email threads, anything else that would be helpful for us to understand is good to send to us back at that point. Uh, so once you've, yeah, and so make sure you send uh, that template or both of those templates back to your OPB analyst by the morning that it's due and sooner if possible. So please fill out. So our fiscal note responses always include a summary, uh, which provides an overview of how the bill impacts the UW. So if the bill is no impact, we only need the summary. Those are our easiest fiscal notes. Uh, but if there is an impact, you will need to fill out one or more of the following impact narratives and templates. So one is cash receipts, typically only relevant to bills regarding the collection of a tax or fee. For UW, that's things like tuition or library fees. Uh, we don't have a ton of fiscal notes that involve cash receipts, so usually that's blank for us. Uh, expenditures, that's our main one, uh, or that's the cost to implement a bill. So include all assumptions made in your estimate and show your work as much as possible. OFM needs to be able to duplicate your work and understand why you calculated things the way you did. And we also need to be able to do that. Uh, and you'll wanna call out workload and cost drivers. So why does the bill cost money? What's driving that cost? Is it needed for upgraded software, additional personnel, travel cost, uh, anything like that. Then we have FTE. Uh, so in the FTE section, indicate if additional staff time would be required to implement the bill. The confusing thing is that 
Uh, the FTE section displays a list of and number of the type of FTE that would be needed, but the cost of those FTEs go in the expenditure table. So the FTE table is just for the staff and like 0.5 FTE. It's not for the actual cost of those people. Uh, and hopefully that should be clear in the uh, template. And then lastly is capital. So capital FTEs and expenditures didn't used to be reported this way, but they are now reported in the same manner as operating costs. Um, most capital costs, like a new printer, new software, other new sort of items that you need to buy, actually belong under operating expenditures. So chances are you won't use this section. If you're at all unsure whether you do have capital expenses for your fiscal note, uh, talk to your analyst and they can help you figure that out. So this is what your narrative template will look like. So you'll have a summary, which will be the brief overview of the bill. Uh, for shorter or less complicated fiscal notes and bills, that can usually just be a sentence or two, super brief. Uh, for a more complicated bill or a more complicated fiscal note, sometimes you'll do like one sentence summary overall and then one sentence per section. That can make it really helpful later when we get like a substitute, second substitute engrossed to keep track of how that summary should change. So then you'll have your expenditures and that's your cost drivers by section with your assumptions, subtotals, and total by fiscal year. And we usually try to break those out in section. So this one has like section two and then subsection impacts. And then you'll have section three or whatever the other sections are that also uh, impact the UW. And then we have our calculations. So as you can see here, we have to break expenditures out by object code. Uh, in the Excel file, each of those object codes and I have just a few of them listed here, but there's more There's more in the actual template itself. Uh, each one of those has a comment on it that explains a little bit more what each of those are. If you're at all unsure which object code something should be assigned to, we can help you figure that out. Uh, this fiscal note example was from a bill that required a UW director or professor to attend a working group in Olympia. So this required a small amount of FTE, like 0.02, so 2% of their time. Uh, which resulted in 2% of their salary and 2% of their yearly faculty benefits amount, and then some travel costs to and from Olympia. So if, for example, they had also needed to buy some materials for that, that would go in our goods and services. And note that this example is from last biennium. So this year's fiscal years will include fiscal year 22 through fiscal year 27. So what if there are too many unknowns, which happens in a fair amount of our fiscal notes? So you can do an indeterminate fiscal note, but I like to think of indeterminate fiscal notes as our last resort. OFM would generally prefer that we do determinate fiscal notes and give a range of scalable options, listing out how different assumptions would lead to different estimates, choosing what we think is the most likely outcome. If we still can't guess that and there's just no way to predict the outcome or know this outcome at this time, uh, then an indeterminate fiscal note that explains why the impact is indeterminate and gives some estimates and ranges or scenarios is our best bet. Uh, we want to try to use indeterminate fiscal notes sparingly, as a few years ago, OFM did an analysis and found that indeterminate fiscal notes are less likely to be funded. And of course, if something costs UW, we would like our best chance to get funded for that. Uh, a recent-ish change that was new last year uh, is that we can now include the determinate aspects of an indeterminate fiscal note in the table. So before we could only include that in the narrative, now we can put some determinate aspects in the table, even if there are other aspects that we don't know. So for example, uh, if we don't know the volume of patients that would be impacted by a proposed healthcare policy, but we do know that we would need 20 hours to attend a work group three times a year on this policy, uh, we can give scalable possibilities for the patient volume impact in the narrative and some different possible costs for that, uh, and put the known work group costs in the table and and in the narrative too. So we don't use this a ton because I think sometimes the messaging can be a little bit confusing, but if we do have aspects of an indeterminate fiscal note that we know, uh, we can put that in the table now and we always wanna put that in the narrative too. So some final tips and reminders. Uh, like Jesse said, fiscal notes take priority over general bill analysis. Uh, respond as soon as possible. It's really helpful for me and the other analysts if you at least respond just to let us know that you received the email so we know we can kind of check that part off. Uh, loop others in as needed. So that might be other units. It might be our Bothell and Tacoma campus. Uh, like I said, avoid indeterminate responses when possible and explain why if it's no impact. 
You want to write for a general audience, so avoid jargon and spell out acronyms. Assume that they don't know the same things that you do. Uh, identify and explain all assumptions. Your calculations should be repeatable and your logic should be clear. You want to report the bill's incremental impact over current law. So this is only for new costs and impacts, not anything that we're currently doing. Identify costs and receipts at one time or ongoing. Current dollars, no inflation. So we know that like, salaries and other things will get inflated over the years, but unfortunately we can't build that into our fiscal notes, even though it's probably true. Um, and make sure you're being clear about whether something is just happening one fiscal year, a couple fiscal years, or all fiscal years. Uh, consider implementation dates. So what fiscal years are affected? And for additional staff time, we need title, full-time annual salary, their benefits rate or their classification, so classified professional or faculty, uh, and either the FTE or the hours they'll need per year to do the work. And remember, we just need estimates and your best guesses. And sort of a last thing is a reminder that they're uh, not a request, or they are a request, they're not a, they're not a guarantee. So we can say that we think something will cost X amount of money. Uh, even if that bill passes, that doesn't necessarily mean we'll get that much money. Um, but fiscal notes are our best opportunity to potentially get as much as we think something will cost. It's unfortunately just not a guarantee. Additional resources. Uh, on the OPB website under state operations, there is a page dedicated to fiscal notes. Uh, we'll have a copy of this fiscal note presentation and a full fiscal note example. Uh, there's also tips for responding to fiscal note requests, including, including the list of reminders that was on the last slide. And questions. And I saw someone, there was some activity in the chat, but I didn't see what it said. Uh, Pam asked about standard assumptions that apply to all, all fiscal notes. I think you uh, covered a lot of that on this slide. There's also more information on the fiscal notes page. Um, she did ask specifically about uh, wage increases. We don't assume any wage increases moving forward. That's something that the legislature specifically asks us not to do. Yeah, which is unfortunate because it's not true, but there it is. Yeah, we're unfortunately not allowed to build in inflation or wage increases, even if we think that will be the case, even if we know that will be the case. Any other questions about fiscal notes? All right, seeing none. Uh, now that we've covered essential updates, I'll uh, give a little bit of an outlook about what we're expecting to see this session and the governor's budget, um, and then I'll pass it off to Joe. So this is a biennial session. Biennial sessions last 105 days with the possibility of one or more 30-day special sessions. Uh, our our uh, timeline this year is January 11th through April 25th. Biennial budgets are usually our opportunity uh, to ask for new initiatives and program expansions, but of course this year is a little bit different given the budget situation, which I'll talk about a little bit uh, more. The legislature is tasked with passing a, a two-year budget, um, operating capital transportation, uh, and those will fund state government through mid-2023. And this year we also expect a uh, 2021 supplemental budget, which will affect the current fiscal year. And lastly, bill introductions start from a clean slate. So we'll have House Bill 1000, Senate Bill 5000. We're already, we already have about 100 bills each in the House and Senate um, that have been pre-filed for introduction. So it goes without saying that the uh, state budget took an unanticipated turn for the worse last year. Um, as a result, much of the new funding that was passed by the legislature last session was vetoed by the governor just one month after the supplemental budget passed. The June revenue forecast after session, um, which was released in the height of the shutdown, anticipated a nearly $9 billion revenue shortfall over the current and upcoming biennia. Luckily, the more recent forecasts in September and November have been quite a bit more promising, um, though still far below what was anticipated before COVID. There's still about a $1.8 billion deficit in each the current year and the upcoming biennium compared to what was passed in the current biennial budget. Uh, due to the revenue situation, uh, OFM requested that agencies limit budget requests for 2021-23 to only the most essential items, which we complied with, which is why we didn't kind of open up the usual process this year for units to submit uh, proposed budget requests. 
Um, Governor Inslee's budget, uh, which I'll discuss in a moment, uh, is based on the November forecast, and then we expect a new uh, forecast in February or March, which the legislature will use to, to craft their budget proposal. So we might see a little bit of movement by then. Governor Inslee's budgets uh, were released in December. There's a full OPB brief on our website if you want to dig in, but at a, at a high level, his operating uh, budget relies on new revenue from a new capital gains tax and a tax on health insurers. The proposed operating budgets would increase state funding for UW Medical Center and Harborview Medical Center in the current year and upcoming biennium um, and would provide funding for most of the university's limited operating requests. Unfortunately, the governor proposed a couple compensation items that result in budget cuts and savings, including required for, uh, furloughs for all state employees uh, and a salary freeze throughout the biennium. So those would obviously all affect uh, the university. We're still waiting more detail from OFM. The, the governor's budget basically uh, mentioned a policy bill that has not been released and won't be released for maybe a couple more weeks. So uh, they kind of left us without information on that. So we're gonna um, hopefully get more information and we'll share that with you. We'll probably update our governor's budget brief when that comes out. Um, some of you might recall that the approved budget last year included a new several million dollar charge uh, for central services to support One Washington, the state's uh, new financial uh, core financial system. Uh, the governor's budget proposal would fix the formula for that charge, meaning that the university would uh, not have to divert nearly as much incremental tuition revenue to support that activity. So we're really happy to see that. That's one of our priorities this year, something we're tracking closely. On the capital side, the, the governor would fulfill all of the university's requests, including for the College of Engineering, Health Sciences Building, uh, Anderson Hall, and Milgard Hall in Tacoma. And then there's a big piece of, of that, which is the uh, Behavioral Health Teaching Facility at UW Medical Center Northwest, uh, which was initiated in the last biennial capital budget. Finally, uh, it's Notably, the governor did not propose any changes to the state's current tuition policy, so that's another issue that we're monitoring closely given the, the overall revenue situation. That's about it on that front. As a reminder, uh, House and Senate leadership will release their own proposals over the course of session, and we'll be releasing briefs on those. That's the first link uh, with an arrow there. Uh, and we will also be sending out session-related emails and updating our OPB blog for any budget proposals and revenue forecasts. So stay tuned to those as well. Uh, are there any questions for me before I pass it off to Joe for the main event here? So I'm seeing a, a question from uh, Jane. Has there been discussion on cuts for this fiscal year? Um, that's a good question. The Like I mentioned, the revenue forecast for this fiscal year is still $1.8 billion um, below kind of the cost of, of the budget. So they will need to do something. Uh, they do have funds in, in reserve and there are some other things that they can do. Hopefully they won't. Um, well, it's kind of yet to be seen. Obviously that would be a pretty big impact given that we're already halfway through fiscal year uh, 21. So that's something that we're monitoring closely. And that's that would be changed in the supplemental budget, which I mentioned. And they could pass a supplemental budget sooner than later and then pass a biennial budget later in session. So uh, we're watching for all of that. I think that's all the questions I see in the chat. Joe, you want to take it away? Sure. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm uh, Joe Dack. I'm the state relations director. Um, I'm part of a, the state relations team with uh, Maggie Use and Morgan Hickel. Um, so I want to recognize uh, they are very uh, very good at what they do and help this whole thing go. Uh, and we are very grateful for our partnership with OPB and all of you. Um, who are absolutely critical uh, to us doing our job and communicating on um, hundreds and hundreds of pieces of legislation and funding priorities in Olympia. Uh, we rely on everybody on campus um, to, be, uh, to be effective down there. So thanks for that. Um, so just in terms of uh, kind of the rules of the road, um, I think, you know, it's important to remember uh, of course, what's legal and what's not legal, that's always a good starting point. Um, 
but also just sort of some policy things and and um, just things to keep in mind as we, as we get into uh, legislative season season next week. Um, obviously, uh, you can engage in the political pro process as a private individual when you go home at night and use your own email. Uh, I hope that is always the case forever. Um, you can certainly uh, educate elected officials um, on issues of policy. You know, obviously, we have a, a wealth of knowledge at the university on a, on every topic under the sun, and um, I think it's a great resource for the state to have um, the university as a resource. So if, if uh, somebody asks you a question about a policy area or, a, or a, a study that's been done or some research that's been done, of course, um, and we can certainly help uh, connect folks to legislators on, on those types of inquiries. Um, we, we often get requests from staff on different matters. Obviously, we want to be, uh, be as responsive as possible. Um, you can uh, direct lobby um, using, you know, your UW email and and um, and UW uh, time. Uh, it needs to be reported, and you probably uh, get an email from Maggie Use on our team once a couple times a quarter, and that is the way to do that. So if you have questions on how do I report and, and those types of things, um, uh, Maggie Use become uh, our resident expert on all things PDC. Um, you can uh, lobby a legislator in your own time and certainly mention what you do at the UW. I think it's important, uh, particularly when things are being done in writing and in testimony, that if you are not speaking on behalf of the university, um, to, to say that, to say, hey, this is what I do professionally, but I'm not speaking on behalf of the university because um, I think a lot of times those, um, those things get intertwined uh, and there's a lot of, uh, a lot of considerations to, be, uh, to, to think through. Um, it, it, there's a, a bullet at the bottom that just says, please work with us. You know, if, if you're planning uh, to testify on a bill in your official capacity, um, please let us know. Um, you know, a lot of times we'll ask you to do so, particularly if it's a complicated bill um, that, um, you know, if, if me or someone from, from our team is, is thinking about testifying and says, well, if I get a question on X, Y, or Z, I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to answer it. A lot of times we'll ask folks from campus to, to either join us for testimony uh, or testify uh, on, on our behalf, just if it's a really technical bill. Um, so, but if it's not, just, just stay in touch with us. Um, we're, we're not, um, uh, we can't you know, know everything that's going on, but it's, it makes us look uh, a lot more coordinated uh, when you reach out to us and let us know. So next slide, please. Um, things that you, you can't do. Um, Really, the the main uh, I think problem that folks on campus run into or have questions about more, I, I should say, is about this notion of grassroots lobbying. So, um, grassroots lobbying is basically the easiest example is um, there's a bill or there's some funding in play, and you use your UW email to email everybody that works in your department and say, "Hey, this is really important." you should email your senator or representative and tell them that this is really important. And you do that on your UW email. That is expressly uh, uh, not allowed uh, under, uh, under ethics laws. And so um, really, I think the, the sort of quote unquote call to action is really what you, you, need to, um, you need to avoid. We really can't, it is against um, state law to, to use your state taxpayer funded email uh, to sort of organize folks uh, for a cause uh, that's, you know, involves the legislature. Um, you also cannot, you know, participate in political campaigns um, or work on ballot initiatives using UW time or resources. So again, that means, are you on the clock? Are you using your UW email? Obviously, those are things that lots of people do in their own time on their own email. So just make sure that there's a, uh, a bright line between those activities. Next slide, please. Um, meeting with legislators um, and testifying before a committee, again, it's going to look a lot different uh, this year than it normally does. Normally, we um, tell folks where to park and um, where to go and those types of things. That is not, not going to happen. Um, but most of these um, things still are, are, are still in play, um, and particularly Wi-Fi, which uh, we're all going to struggle with. I, I've got to figure out where the best place in my house is to, to testify. Um, being on early, I think, is going to be really important. Nobody really knows how these hearings are going to go. We think they'll be orderly and they've practiced, but we're not totally sure. Um, flexibility is important. You know, whether it's in person or online, the order of the bills always change because 
um, they're waiting for the sponsor to, to show up or to log on to testify. It changes all the time. Um, so we just have to be flexible. Uh, we really try and be gracious, um, even when we're um, testifying in opposition to a bill, uh, to, to try and give uh, the sponsor and the folks that are working on the bill the best, you know, understand their intentions, certainly not disparage um, political parties or other institutions or programs or, or really anybody. Um, we try and take the high road uh, uh, on all occasions. Um, I think using concrete examples about and really um, trying to explain why, you know, what's happening now at the university, why this would, what, what would, what this bill would do to change what's happening right now at the university and why that's a bad thing, why it's a bad thing for students or for faculty or for operations or for just the state as a whole. I think really breaking it down into simple terms, at least for your initial testimony, and then they, they can ask technical questions if need be, is really um, the way to be the most effective on these types of things. Um, the other thing I'd say is um, if you don't know the answer, um, that's okay. It's, it's, it's okay to say that you don't know the answer. We have, uh, we do follow up constantly with the, with the legislature, uh, with legislators and staff. Um, I say, I don't know the answer all the time and we'll find it and move on. Um, that is not a, that's not a, um, uh, that's not a guilty thing to do. So please uh, keep that in mind if, if you're testifying in Olympia. So our agenda, um, you know, it's a lot of this was alluded to. I'll, I'll start with kind of what it's going to look like. Again, the legislature is going to go down uh, in person for one day uh, on Monday. They're going to change the rules uh, on uh, e in each chamber about how they can engage, uh, and then they're all going to go back to to their home. I think um, obviously the events of yesterday have. Um, added another reason why this is, is, is probably best to be a remote uh, session. Um, I don't even think staff will be allowed in the buildings, at least for a while. Um, initially, there was a, a sense that while well, some members and some staff, if they were distanced, could be in the Capitol physically, I, I think that's very much in jeopardy. Um, as Jen mentioned, this is a, this is a, a long session. Um, the Democrats control, uh, obviously, the governor's mansion uh, in both uh, chambers of the House. Uh, ironically, after the election, uh, the seat counts, the majority counts remained exactly the same. Um, we do have a new Senate minority leader, Senator John Braun, who is a, a UW grad um, and a new chair of the House College and Workforce Development Committee, Representative Slatter, also a UW grad. So good, good to have some Huskies in positions of, of influence in Olympia. And the big legislative topics are, are what you, I think, would expect if you read a newspaper uh, is COVID-19, public health, uh, economic recovery, um, data privacy has been, a, has been an issue that's been kicking around Olympia for a while and, and may get across the finish line this year. And, and, and obviously diversity, equity, and inclusion impacts on all parts of society, including state government. Um, and police reform will be, a, um, will be one of those issues that, that um, I think will get a lot of attention in Olympia. In general, what I would say is that the number of bills um, will be fewer. It, it just, um, there's just no way that they can crank out the number, the volume of legislation that um, really the most, I think, challenging spot will be off the House floor um, because you'll have, you know, members remoting in and just the process of, of, um, of amendments uh, and all those kinds of things, it's just going to take time. Um, and I think on the, on the committee side, it will be somewhat dependent on how how much the public participates. I mean, usually there's a pretty big barrier to, for those of you that have driven to Olympia from Seattle in the middle of February, it's not a particularly pleasant experience. Um, once you get there, it's kind of nice, but it's a long drive and it's hard to park. And so a lot of you know folks from the public do not testify. It's a lot of people like uh, Morgan and Maggie and myself who are paid to be down there to do it. That is gonna change this year. How much it changes, I think, will impact just how many um, bills can get out of committee. If you've got a two-hour committee and you've got, you know, 100 people signed up, well, you're only doing one bill. You're not getting through five, six bills in that committee session. So it will be interesting to see. Um, so for our agenda, um, Jed mentioned that uh, a lot of these were, um, were funded in the governor's budget. I think we have a couple of sort of broad priorities. Obviously, we are trying to 
um, avoid cuts uh, that we've seen in, in basically every uh, economic downturn in our state's modern history. We are, we are trying to avoid that, that pattern of state revenues go down, let's cut pu public higher education and then jack up tuition. We, we are trying to avoid that cycle, uh, create history by avoiding that cycle this time around. Um, I think uh, we have a pathway to do so. Um, and the, the, you know, you all know, you all are, are living and breathing this every day. You, you know why that matters. Uh, and there's some bullets there. And those are the things that we're gonna be talking about and have been talking about uh, to the legislature. The other big priority is um, uh, preserving and expanding state support for the work of UW, UW Medicine and our UW Dentistry Clinics. I think um, what has happened in this country and certainly in the state over the last year has put a good uh, spotlight on the importance of UW Medicine and the work that they do and the public health role that they play in our state. Um, UW Dentistry, in addition, you know, just the work that they do and the populations they serve to have more state support so they can continue that work is kind of another, you know, huge priority for, uh, for us down in Olympia this year. Um, some other things that we're working on that, um, again, are, are sort of holdovers from things that projects that have either have been started or obligations that have been made um, uh, uh, lease support for our new um, uh, medical school facility in Spokane with Gonzaga. That lease was signed last year, so we are obligated. We need help from the state to, um, to make those operating costs go. Um, Jed mentioned the One Washington system. We were really pleased um, that the One Washington uh, formula was reformed in the governor's budget. We are going to be working very hard uh, to see that uh, reflected in the final budget because it uh, effectively takes student tuition dollars out of the university to pay for the state's financial aid system or the state's financial system. Uh, and that doesn't make a lot of sense to us. Um, operations funding for the health, new health sciences building. Again, if you drive down Pacific, you'll see a big hole in the ground. I think there's, there may be some things up now, but um, that is a building that's being built and we need money to operate it. So that is an obligation. And then um, investments in the behavioral health workforce. Uh, these are, these are, programs that were started in the last biennium that had ramp ups. Um, and so uh, we need additional funds to, to keep those obligations on track for um, child psych fellowships uh, and uh, that we will operate. Next slide, please. Capital budget priorities. Again, Jed mentioned these um, uh, really three uh, construction projects, one for the College of Engineering in Seattle, one for UW Tacoma, and then the, the teaching uh, behavioral health teaching facility up at Northwest. Um, and then two design projects, uh, one for the next phase of Magnuson Health Sciences uh, and three million for uh, Anderson Hall, which serves the College of the Environment uh, here in Seattle campus. So again, the governor's budget funded all of these. So if we can, uh, if we can replicate that on the, on the final uh, budget, we'll be in good shape. Next slide, please. Um, I'll mention, this is just sort of an underscoring of what happened in the governor's budget. I, I talked in an earlier slide about preserving and expanding support of UW Medicine. Obviously, um, 50 million annually in additional funding and, and 60 million in one-time uh, COVID support is a pretty big expansion of what they have been doing previously, but we feel it's necessary. This is what the governor's budget had included. Um, and so this is where, um, this is our starting point in terms of talking to the legislature and our partners at UW Medicine uh, government relations will be um, hard at work um, to try and uh, carry this request forward to the legislature. Again, highlighting the, the public health role that UW Medicine plays, whether we're in a pandemic or not. But I think the pandemic has kind of put a spotlight on that work. Next slide, please. Um, this has been uh, talked about throughout the presentation. Um, we, we, again, this is just, we really rely on campus folks to be um, responsive and um, we rely on your expertise because there's no way that we could um, extract all of your knowledge uh, and, and be an expert on 500 topics in Olympia. We rely on you all to help us do our job and, and um, represent the university and the people that work there effectively. Um, we may bother you after five o'clock. We apologize in advance. Um, we'll try not to do it too much. Um, if, you're, if you're planning on testifying on a bill or meeting with the legislature, give us a heads up. Um, it's just helpful for us because we often get asked, um, hey, shouldn't you know everything that the, you know, everybody at the university is doing? That's not, it's sort of impossible, but um, we can help and be, everyone can be a lot more effective, just know uh, what's going on. So I just ask you to do that. 
And um, and like I said, Morgan and Maggie are, are tremendous team members and always very responsive. So if I don't pick up my phone and it's a uh, an urgent need, one of them will, I, I'm certain. So uh, that's have, unless there's something on the, the final slide that I forgot. Nope, those are pictures of us and our cell phones and emails. So um, happy to take questions. opening up the chat. I don't see any yet. Need any questions? We can answer any questions about any other piece as well while we're at it at the end here. <clears throat> Joe, uh, Sarah asked if, uh, or she said, I, I'm sure folks would appreciate your thoughts about the revenue package. Okay, sure. I assume in the go in the governor's budget. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's uh, it's something that they've been talking about. This is a, a, a capital gains tax. Um, is something that um, Democrats have been talking about in Olympia for a couple of years. Um, I think the um, you know, and, and certainly there have been. Um, challenges or questions to the legality of it is, is it an income tax, which um, could be in violation of the state's constitution? Is it not? Um, the other sort of de deliberation will be, is it, is it necessary um, given the state's revenue, improved revenue picture? Um, I think the other factor that I would consider is, you know, they're with um, sort of a, a, a new trajectory in DC in terms of who's in charge back there. You know, is there going to be a, a stimulus package that includes state aid that can kind of, you know, pay for some of those things? I, I think those are all things that I would um, that I would consider, but it's going to be uh, it's going to be a challenge. There's a reason that they haven't done it yet. It's going to be hard. Um, so uh, and the question will be for, you know, balancing it is a is it difficult It's difficult for certain members to take that vote. Uh, and it's also um, whether they feel like they need to do it. I, I don't know the answer to that question. They also have to weigh how many, invest, the kind of investments that they'd like to make, that all is kind of up in the air. Um, certainly the governor's office felt like it was necessary and uh, made some significant investments, including in the University of Washington um, and, and UW Medicine. So um, it all remains to be seen. It's gonna be an interesting, interesting debate. There's a question of uh, when do we expect House and Senate budgets? That'll be after the next revenue forecast, um, which will probably be released in March. So late March or in April, you know, sometimes they're released right toward the end of session. It just depends on on how they get the house together. Yeah, late March is usually a good a good guess. else i'll hang out for a few minutes if there are any other questions so feel free to to stay on and, and ask questions there but um otherwise uh, let everybody go